All right, Colossians 3, we're going to be in verses 1 through 4 today. Let's read it together, and then I'll pray for us. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Let me pray. Lord God, um, we just come to you now asking that by your Spirit's power, you might illuminate this text, Lord, for us today. That you would give us understanding, that we would see the beautiful realities in this passage. God, that tell us about what happened to us when we trusted in Christ how through his death and resurrection, we're not only forgiven, we're not only brought into the family of God, we're not only given Christ's righteousness, Lord, we are united with Christ himself. Lord, as we will see, Jesus is our life if we are a Christian. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to understand that and know that I pray that you would remove distractions from the room. And God, I pray that I wouldn't say anything, but that you would say what you want to say and that you would be pleased with our study of your word today. God, we love you, and we thank you. Thank you for Jesus and sending him to die and rise again for us. In his name, amen. All right, so I know it's been a little while since we've been in Colossians. It's kind of the nature of being here at TCS. But in the last couple of messages that we've had, um, since the beginning of this semester, there's been this doctrine that's really emerged in our study, right? It's kind of come to the forefront. And that doctrine is this idea of union with Christ. Does anybody remember what union with Christ is? What do I mean by that phrase? What is union with Christ? Somebody tell me. Anybody? No? Well, let me read a quote from uh, John Piper. I read it before. I think it's a helpful definition of this doctrine. Piper said that union with Christ is the reality of all the ways that the Bible pictures our human connectedness to Christ, in which he is indispensable for every good that we enjoy. I'm going to read that again, because apparently we need a refresher. Union with Christ is the reality of all the ways that the Bible pictures our human connectedness to Christ, in which he is indispensable for every good that we enjoy. I know I'm hopping right into this today, but I think we need to. Listen, when we talk about this idea of union with Christ, we're saying that if you are a Christian, if you trusted in Jesus for salvation, if he saved you through his death and resurrection, then union with Christ means that you have been brought into a connectedness with him. You are now in a relationship with him that is intimate and personal, and you are in a real sense connected with Jesus himself. And what this definition says from Piper that I think is helpful for us is that every good thing that you experience as a Christian, every single good thing that you have in your life as a believer comes to you because of your union with Jesus. You have been brought into union with Jesus and then every single good thing you have as a Christian, every benefit of the Christian life we get, comes to you because of your union with Jesus. All of today's message is going to be about that idea. That's what we're talking about today. And I can already see there's some distractions in the room. People are kind of turning their heads and that sort of thing. And I just want to say right up front, I'm not going to say anything else about it. Let me just say this. What we're talking about today is incredibly important for your life if you are a follower of Christ. Getting this idea of union with Christ will affect every other area of your Christian life. That's why I'm jumping into it right away. It affects the way that you live and grow in knowing Christ. It affects your understanding of what Jesus did for you on the cross. It affects the way that you have relationships with other people and specifically other Christians. We're going to see all of that, and that's what we're talking about today. So what I want to do before we hop into Colossians 3, 1 through 4 is I want to take some time um, to look back over the context of Colossians with you. Okay, so everybody should have a Bible open in front of you. You need to have a Bible. I want you to look down at your Bible. 
I'm going to start in the beginning of chapter 1, and what I want to do is just, I'm not reading the whole thing, I'm going to briefly walk through it with you, and I want to see how we've gotten here. How have we gotten to Colossians 3, where this idea of union with Christ is really coming to the forefront, to the, the front of what Paul's saying. We want to see how he got there, and then I want to also, as we do that, look at how this idea of our connectedness with Jesus through the gospel, how that idea has already started coming up in this book, okay? So let's start right at the very beginning. Look at your Bibles with me at chapter 1, verse 1. We're told here at the beginning of Colossians that this letter is written by Paul. We're told in verse 2 that it's written to the church at Colossae. And then that subject line there at the beginning, end of verse 2, is grace to you and peace from God our Father. So remember, Colossians is a letter. It's a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church at Colossae, and he's writing to them even though he's never met them before because he's heard from Epaphras, the guy who planted the church, that there's a false teaching threatening the church. You guys remember that? There's a false teaching coming to the church, and Paul is writing to them. So even here in the beginning, though, we start getting some ideas of this idea of union with Christ. We start getting some, some precursors, some, some pointing towards it. Look at verse 2. Look at how Paul describes the church at Colossae. He calls them the saints and faithful brothers in Christ. Right up here at the front, they are in Christ. And then in verses 3 through 14 of chapter 1, Paul moves from his introduction there, his, his um, kind of greeting, the, the letter writing there, he moves into describing his prayer for the church. Specifically, he thanks God that the gospel, the good news of Jesus and his death and resurrection has come to them and that they've received Christ. And then he also prays that they would grow in maturity, that they'd grow in knowing Christ in verses 9 through 14. And in this prayer, there's all sorts of things that point us toward the idea of Christ, but the very end of it really, I mean, it just reeks of it. Look at verse 13. Paul ends this section by saying, He, God, has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. That idea of union with Christ is starting to leak through even there. Then after his prayer for the church, look at verses 15 through 23. Paul moves into this hymn-like section. Remember, it's almost like a hymn, and it's describing the supremacy of Jesus and of what Jesus has done for us through his death and resurrection, his work. And Paul lays this strong foundation about how Jesus is higher than anything else. He's the most supreme in the universe. And he lays that down to provide a basis for the sufficiency of Jesus. Jesus is not only the highest, but he's also everything that we need, which then points us to the fact that if we are in union with Jesus, why would we need anything else? Look at verse 24 of chapter 1. From 124 to 25, there's the third section there, and Paul talks about his ministry. He talks about the goals of his ministry in general, that in his ministry he's seeking Christian maturity. He wants to see them grow. And as Paul is talking about his desire to see the Colossians grow, he talks about how he preaches a mystery. Look at verse 27 of chapter 1. He says, to make, known among the Gentiles, to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you. Union with Christ, again, right there. Christ in you the hope of glory. Later he'll say the mystery is Christ there in chapter 2 and in chapter 4. And then after describing his ministry, we get to the hinge of the letter, verses 6 and 7 of chapter 2. We talked about this, the very beginning of this semester. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. That's where we really started talking about the doctrine of union with Christ here in verses 6 and 7 of chapter 2. And that led us directly into verse 8 through the end of chapter 2, where Paul speaks directly against the false teaching coming to Colossae. Look at your Bibles, guys. It's right in front of you. Starting in verse 8, Paul starts to lay out the problems with the false teachers. They were saying that if you really want to grow in Christianity, if you want the full experience of Christianity, you need to add in other ideas, other religious ideas, other ph philosophical ideas. You need those if you're really going to grow in Christ. And Paul lays out that the Colossians have already received everything they need when they received Christ, when they believed the gospel. And as Paul is doing that, Paul repeatedly points to this idea again of union with Christ. 
Look at verse 12. He says that you have been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And then again in verse 13, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him. And then at the end of that section, in verse 20 of chapter 2, Paul again references our union with Christ. He says, if with Christ you died. So Paul starts here talking about that not only are we connected with Christ, but if we are connected with Christ in this way, then we have died with Jesus, and we have been buried with Jesus, and we have risen again with Jesus already in some real sense. We've experienced what Jesus did. And so that section we just walked through, where Paul speaks against the false teachers, leads us now into chapter 3, where we are today. So Paul has brought up this doctrine. Again, I'm keeping saying that phrase, union with Christ. I hope it just doesn't become numb to you. I'm saying that phrase because I really think you guys need to understand this idea. Our union with Jesus Christ. Paul uses that doctrine to speak against the false teachers saying you need something more. Does that make sense? The false teachers are saying you need something more. Paul says, no, you've already been connected with Jesus. And it's almost a negative instruction, right? He's instructing against the false teachers there by using union with Christ. In Colossians 3, 1 through 4, though, Paul takes the same idea, and instead of negatively instructing against teachers, Paul then turns to speaking positively. He's talking about how our union with Christ will affect our lives. So in in verse 19 of chapter 2, Paul says that the false teachers don't hold fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with the growth that is from God. So real growth comes from holding fast to Jesus. And here in chapter 3, all the way through the first verse of chapter 4, Paul is going to talk about what that looks like. If you're connected with Jesus, how will that affect all of your life? So where we're going to be for the next three messages that we have here in chapel is in chapter 3 through the first verse of chapter 4. And what we're going to be talking about and seeing there is the way that Paul takes this doctrine of union with Christ and applies it to every area of life. He takes this idea that if you are a Christian, you have been connected with Jesus Christ in a real sense, and he applies that idea to every aspect of our lives. So let's start at the first part of chapter 3. Paul says, if then you have been raised with Christ. Again, he's referring back to that doctrine. And before Paul gets to any behaviors or actions or the way that we live, Paul starts with our mindset. He starts with our mindset. Look at verse 1 of chapter 3. Look at your Bibles. Paul says, if then... You have been raised with Christ. Seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Verse 2. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. So Paul starts with a command, a command that he says twice. And he's talking about our minds, the way that we think and our wills, the way that we act here before he gets into a list of behaviors, what we put off and put on in in verse 5 through verse 17, which we'll talk about next time. So Paul says that those who have been raised with Christ, who have been brought into union with him, are to seek the things that are above, and then they are to set their minds on things that are above. All right, let's observe a few things about that. First thing I want you to see in this passage is that believers are to set both their hearts and their minds on the things of heaven. Believers are to set both their hearts and their minds on the things of heaven. So first thing we need to look at is that phrase, things that are above. He says it twice in verse 1 and verse 2. Seek the things that are above, set your minds on things that are above. And that phrase refers to things that are from heaven, things that are from above. Paul uses the same wording in Galatians to talk about heaven. So 
is encouraging the, the believers there at Colossae to focus on things from heaven. The NIV does a good job translating this. I think it says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. And then it says, Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. So we seek the things that are above, things that are in heaven, uh, not pearly gates, not mansions, not golden thrones, the values of heaven, the values of God's kingdom. We're called to seek after those things, to pursue them, and we're called to set our minds on those things, to, to think about those things. So believers set their hearts and their minds. They orient their, both their will and their thought life to the things in heaven. Matthew 6, You guys probably know the passage. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Second observation. We focus on heavenly things because heaven is where Jesus is, where the incarnate Christ currently is, seated at the right hand of the Father. We focus on heaven because that's where the incarnate Christ currently is. Look at, at verse 1. It says, Seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. seated at the right hand of God. So Paul, here in this passage, says that we seek the things of heaven because that's where Jesus is. That's the connection with union with Christ. If we've been brought into connection with Jesus, we seek the things from heaven because heaven is where Jesus is. All right, two thoughts about that. Here's the first thought. Look, my, look this way, please. First thought. In heaven is where Jesus actually is right now. So he says where Jesus is, what we're talking about there is that Jesus physically, in his body, is currently in heaven. Have you ever thought about that? Jesus physically is in heaven right now. He's currently sitting in heaven, is what we're told in Scripture. In Acts 1, Paul, uh, uh, Luke talks about the ascension, that Jesus physically rose into heaven, and he's been there since, in the same body he has had since his incarnation. He's incarnate in heaven right now, in flesh, and he's awaiting the hour when he will return. So when Paul says to set your minds on things above in heaven, we're setting our minds on the place where Jesus actually physically currently is. And then Paul uses a phrase to describe that further. He says not only is Jesus there, but Jesus is there and seated at the right hand of God. That phrase is linking back to a, a passage in the Old Testament. It's Psalm 110. But what's, what's going on there is it's talking about that Jesus is not only in heaven, but he has the highest place in heaven, the place of honor and prestige and majesty and authority. Jesus is physically in heaven now, and he has the seat of authority in heaven. And we have been brought into union with him if we have believed in Christ. That's the key. If we have believed in Christ. And so therefore, we're called to set our minds on heaven. One third thought about this section. One third thought. Look at, look at um, verse 2. It says, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Not on things that are on earth. So Paul says that we set our minds on heavenly things, instead of setting our minds on earthly things. And I think he's making a direct dig at the false teachers at Colossae. He's, he's pointing at them directly. So Paul told us that the false teachers were um, according to the elemental spirits of the world. He already said that twice. And so though, though the false teachers, they're obsessed with these visions and angels and all these heavenly realities, they think that they can acquire those heavenly things by focusing on earthly disciplines, by focusing on the here and now. And Paul says that you don't focus on earth to get heaven. You focus on heaven, and when you do that, it'll affect earth. Paul swaps what the false teachers are doing. All right, turn to Philippians 3. Turn to Philippians 3. It's a similar passage here that points out some of these same ideas in Philippians 3, 12 through 21. Philippians 3, 12 through 21. And I think this will help kind of draw together what Paul's saying there with seeking the things that are above, setting our minds on the things above. 
All right, starting in verse 12 of Philippians 3. It says, Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. This is Paul writing here as well. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have obtained. So he says he strains forward to what lies ahead. And then in verse 17, Brothers, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many, of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. So here in this section, again, let's review where we're at. Paul takes this doctrine of the fact that if you are in Jesus, you have been connected with Jesus, and he's starting to apply that to all of life. And the first thing he does in these first four verses, especially the first two verses, is Paul is going to talk about our mindset. He's told us that if we are in union with Christ, that should affect our minds and our hearts, our will and our thought life. And we should focus our lives towards the things of heaven. Because heaven is is where Jesus, the one we have brought in union with, is. We've been brought into union with Jesus, and so we seek the things of Jesus' domain. We don't focus on the things of earth. I would venture to guess in this room that many of us, even now, become preoccupied with the things of earth. I know I do. I'll worry about things with my kids or even health things or money things or family situations. I will think about those around me. Even now, I worry about are they listening? Do they care about what I have to say? Is it something that I'm doing wrong? I can become preoccupied with the things of earth. But if you are a Christian, if you are a Christian, Paul says in Philippians 3, your citizenship is in heaven. And he calls us here in Colossians to seek the things that are from heaven. We're about to move into a section of this text where Paul takes those commands to seek the things that are above and set your minds on things above, and he's going to cement those in some incredibly deep theology. He wants to make sure that those commands stick for you. And so he gives you truth, and it's truth that is incredibly rich and deep and life-changing. And so I want to take a moment before we even get into that section to speak to those of you who are listening to me. Those of you who are listening, this passage can affect and change your life. This passage is incredibly important for you as a follower of Christ. And I want you to follow Paul's command now. Don't set your minds on things on earth. Whatever's going around you, whatever that is, whatever people are talking about or laughing about, I know I said I wasn't going to mention it, I'm sorry. Don't set your minds on things on earth and let's set them on heaven now and let's together, please, let's, let's soak in this for a moment. Because what Paul's going to do is he's going to lay out further what union with Christ actually means. I know I've said that phrase a million times. But what does that actually mean? If we have been brought into union with Christ, what does that actually mean for us? And what Paul does here is he's going to explain it further in three tenses. Past, present, and future. Past, present, and future. Look at verse 3 of Colossians 3. Turn back to Colossians 3. Look at verse 3. Paul's instructed the Colossians to seek the things that are above, and then he says they are to set their minds on things that are above. And then in verse 3, he says, For you have 
died. Past tense. If you are in Christ, you're dead. You have died. You're gone away with. Life is not about you anymore. Paul speaks of this as a definitive thing that happened in the past when you were converted to following Christ. You died. Christians are people who have died with Christ. They in and of themselves are no more. Look further on. He says, you have died. Then the second part of verse 3, he says, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. So not only have you died, but now your life, the fact that you're still alive, isn't with you. It's with Christ. Our life, our real life, if you're a follower of Christ, your real life is not visible to others around you. Unbelievers around you cannot see the real you. Your real life is hidden with Jesus Christ. It's invisible to the naked eye and found with Christ in heaven. And note in that last phrase, Paul doesn't just say that our life is hidden with Christ. He says it's hidden with Christ in God, the sovereign creator of the universe. Our life is with Him, and it's in God Himself, eternally secure, eternally safe within the unchanging grasp of God. So he says, you have died Your life is hidden with Christ in God. And then look at verse 4. He says, when Christ, who is your life, appears. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So one day, Jesus will be revealed. This is talking about his second coming, that Jesus is coming back. He will return. Jesus will be revealed. He will appear. And Paul says that when Jesus appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. In other words, the real you that was hidden will be made known. You will be glorified in the presence of Christ. Your union with Christ will be made perfectly visible as you are freed from the presence of sin and perfectly conformed to Christ's image. So three tenses. Past tense, if you are in union with Christ, it means you're dead. You don't matter in a real sense. Second one, you've died and your life is now with Jesus. Your life is hidden with him. It's invisible to others, but it's with Christ. And let me clarify again, you don't matter. I don't mean you don't matter as a person, whatever. Jesus died for you. I'm saying that you within yourself, you don't live for yourself anymore. You have died. Your life is hidden with Christ. And then when Christ returns, when he triumphantly returns in his second coming, you will be revealed. You'll be perfectly conformed to his image. All right, I've intentionally skipped over one little part of verse 4. And that's because I want us to focus in there. Look at verse 4 again, chapter 3. He says, when Christ, who is your life, appears. When Christ who is your life appears. Christ is our life. Paul goes so far in talking about our union with Jesus Christ, the fact that we've been connected with him, to say that not only is your life with Christ in God, but your life is Christ. Your life is Jesus himself. Our union with Jesus is so huge, so wide, so big and all-encompassing that Jesus is the believer's life. Followers of Jesus have died to themselves, and now they are so linked to Jesus that their lives could be summed up in that one word, Christ. Your life is Christ. Makes me think of several other verses that you probably know. Right? Philippians 1.21, Paul says, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain, to be with Christ. Or Galatians 
It says, I have, Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. All right, earlier this week, or maybe today for some of you guys, in your Bible classes, you should have gotten a little handout. Um, it's a little handout with a part of a prayer on it. It's part of a larger prayer. The prayer is called St. Patrick's Breastplate. And traditionally, that prayer is attributed to Patrick of Ireland. He was a guy in the 5th century. His story's on the screens around the school. Um, but essentially, he was kind of a rich, bratty kid, grew up in a Christian household. He gets abducted from Britain in the 4th century. He gets abducted at 16 years old by Irish pirates. He becomes a slave in Ireland. For six years, he's left alone in the wilderness to tend sheep. He's, he's lonely and hungry and often naked and in ill health. I mean, horrible situation. But there uh, in Ireland, he comes to understand what it really means to have Christ. And he starts to live every moment with his life connected to Christ. And then miraculously, he escapes from slavery. He comes back to Britain. He Now that he understands what following Jesus means, he wants to become a priest. He starts pursuing ministry. And then God calls this guy, this young man, he gives him a burden to go back to Ireland to preach to the very people who had persecuted him and hurt him and enslaved him and kidnapped him. And so he returns and it's horrible still. He's threatened with his life every day. And yet God miraculously blesses this man's ministry. Thousands come to Christ. Kings of Ireland come to Jesus. Other people come. And to this day, he's known as the Apostle of Ireland. That's the real St. Patrick behind the holiday we just celebrated. And that guy, Patrick of Ireland, traditionally it's said that he wrote this prayer. And part of it, I think, kind of captures this idea of what union with Christ looks like. He said, Christ with me. Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I arise, Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. Those are huge words. Patrick's defining his whole life by Christ. That's what Paul is saying here. Christ is our life. All right, so listen, I'm summing up. If you have been brought to saving faith in Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit's power, then you have been placed in direct union with Jesus Christ himself, with the second person of the Trinity. Jesus is yours, and you are his. Jesus is now in you, and you are now in Jesus. You have died, and Jesus is your life. And so Paul tells us in this passage that you now, as this person who's been given this new status in the all-supreme, all-sufficient Christ, you must set your mind and your heart on the things of heaven, of where Jesus is, not the things of earth. You must set your desires and your thoughts on the things above, Paul says. Richard Baxter, a Puritan, he said, there is nothing but heaven worth setting our hearts upon. There is nothing but heaven worth setting our hearts upon. Which begs the question, and I've tried to bring this question throughout today. It begs the question, what are you seeking? What do you set your mind on? What do you think about? What occupies your time? What do you desire? What, what, what makes you tick, makes you want to go after things in life? Is, are, are you in your life, are you just obsessed with popularity? Do you just want to look cool? Do you want other people to laugh at you? Are you seeking to please other people? Is it your schoolwork? 
Do you just live to make sure that you're going to have the highest GPA? You want to be the valedictorian, the salutatorian, the whatever in your class. All you think about is making sure that you get the highest grade. Or maybe for you, it's, it's relationships. You do everything you can to try to impress a boy or a girl so that you can get that coveted boyfriend or girlfriend so that you have that status and whatever, and you think that you'll find everything in that. Is that what occupies your time? Is it sports? Does everything in your life revolve around being the best on the field? Being absolutely the best you can be at what you do. It could be a hobby. It could be just social media and entertainment and binge watching shows and watching YouTube all day long or whatever it is for you. There are so many ways that we occupy our minds. And the sad reality is that many of us who claim to follow Christ, spend all of our time seeking after and setting our minds on anything but Christ. Many of us who claim to know Jesus spend all of our time seeking after and setting our minds on anything but Jesus. So maybe the bigger question for some of you guys in this room today is this, have you been brought into union with Christ? Have you been brought into union with Christ? Have you repented of your sin? Have you placed your faith in Jesus as your only hope of salvation from the wrath of God that you deserve? Do you understand the gravity of all that Jesus has accomplished for you in his perfect life, his atoning death, and his victorious resurrection. Bottom line here, we're, we're talking about Colossians, we're having a chapel, some of you guys would rather be anywhere else, I get it, but I, I have to ask you, is any of this real for you? I have to ask myself that question. When I get preoccupied, on chapel days, I get preoccupied with setup, making sure the worship team's okay, all kinds of things like that. I can, my mind can go in so many directions. I can worry about so many things so quickly. And I have to ask myself, is this real for me? Paul here talks about our thinking and what we desire because we have to intentionally set our thinking and our desires, our hearts and our minds on Christ every moment of every day. If you are in Christ, then you need to do that. And I think Another question would be, again, is are you in Christ at all? We've got a couple more minutes here today. This is what I'd like to do before we close. I'd like us all to be as quiet as we can be, and I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Philippians 4. Can we turn to Philippians 4? We're going to look at verses 8 and 9. I know we talked about this in peer-to-peer -peer just a few weeks ago, um, so it should be familiar because we walked through it there, but I want to read over it again. Uh, I think that passage is extremely especially helpful as we're talking about having a heavenly mindset, having our mindset on the things above. Paul kind of lays out some of what he wants the Philippian church there to think about. And so I think it'd be helpful to read through that and pray over it and, and consider for yourself, number one, do I think about these things? Is my mind focused on Christ? Is that how I want to live my life? And then maybe for some of you, I really would urge you, consider Am I in union with Christ at all? Is what Mr. Hunter is saying just sound like foreign language and nonsense to me? Do I need to reconsider that? And I will, I'll say as well, it, you know, all of us, these teachers in the back, I know all of us are here for you. We love you. We care about you. We want what's best for you. And if any of you have any questions or concerns, come talk to us. We want to help you. We want to help you know Christ and know him more. That's why we work here why we do what we do. Science teachers, Spanish teachers, history teachers, all of them. That's why we're here. So come and talk to us. Because ultimately, this matter of you being united to Jesus is what matters most. So we're going to take about five minutes to read over this individually and pray over it. Philippians 4, 8, and 9. And then we'll, we'll close in a song here in just a minute. Lord God, I, uh, I thank you for these students. Lord, I thank you that they're here at our school. I thank you for um, just getting to know so many of them, and, and Lord, just uh, what
what a really what a wonderful group they are. And uh, God, I, I ask and I, I beg and I pray that you would open all of our eyes to the importance of what your Apostle Paul said here in Colossians 3. That if we're in Christ, Jesus is our life. That we're called to set our minds on the things above where he is. Lord, I pray that we might understand these things. Lord, that we would see, even as we move into the next chapel message after this, God, I pray that we might see how our connectedness with Jesus through his death and resurrection affects every area of our lives. That it should change everything about the way we think, the way we act, what we do, how we, inter- how we, how we interact with one another. Lord, I pray that you might give us your grace by your spirit to live in that way. Lord, even I think about the next section, it talks about how it affects the community. And there it's talking specifically about the church, but I think some of the same ideas will come into our school. Lord, I pray that you would create a culture here at our school of, of interconnectedness with Jesus Christ. That Christ might dwell in our conversations, in our thoughts, in our studies. And that we might honor and glorify him in all we say and do. God, thank you for how good you are to us. Thank you for giving us your word and giving us the opportunity to study it together. In Jesus' name, amen.